Hello, everyone. Hi. Oh, that was pretty good. I was expecting, like, hello. <laughs> good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right, that was a little better. That's kind of what I was going for. Um, thank you so much, first, to StarCon for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Um, I was talking to Anna last night, and she was like, I can't believe you're flying out to Canada in January. I just realized that. And I was like, I would do it, because I've looked at this conference for the past, like, year or two since it started, and I was like, this is a great conference. Maybe one day I'll get to go. And now here I am. And I brought a winter storm with me, so you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's so exciting to be here. Um, as Anna mentioned, my name is Vaidehi, um, and I am a software engineer at a company called Tilda. Um, we are based in Portland, Oregon, where it rains and doesn't snow that often. Um, and I work on a product called Skylight. Um, you might have heard of it. It is a profiler for Rails and Ruby apps. Um, but if you haven't heard of it, there are some other things that we work on that you may be familiar with, uh, namely some of these technologies and languages. Um, we actually created Ember, which is a front-end framework, and we use it in our app. Um, and we use Rails and Rust, too. And some of my, uh, yeah, Rust, or Rails, or whichever, <laughs> both. <laughs> I'm not supposed to be partial. Um, some of my coworkers actually um, are core team members, so we're pretty involved in the open source aspect of um, these frameworks and languages. Um, yeah, yay open source. I love how this crowd is already cheering, because we're on like slide of three, three of 68. <laughs> So keep that energy going. Um, but the reason I bring this up very quickly uh, is because if any of these technologies uh, sound interesting to you, we actually are hiring. Um, so please come talk to me afterwards. I would love to talk to you about what we do um, and what you do. And um, if you want to work with an awesome team on interesting challenges and learn lots of new things, you might want to come chat. But when I'm not working on Skylight, I spend a good chunk of my free time doing something else, learning new things. So a few years ago, um, I started a new project, uh, which was focused on learning something new and something that I was very uncomfortable with. Uncomfortable with. Um, this project was basically my goal to teach myself computer science. And I decided that I was going to call it something very funny called Base CS, which I have hopefully by now, it's been like over a year since this project came out, but I just do want to point out that there's a pun. It's the basics of computer science. It's also Base CS, like Base 10, Base 2. Um, just in case you weren't awake yet. Um, but the Base CS project that I started was a particularly scary undertaking. Um, because I do not have a background in computer science. My degree is actually in English. Um, so the, the voice in my head, the English major voice in my head today was like, oh, this is a computer science conference. What are you doing? But it's all right. <laughs> Here I am. Um, this was a particularly scary project for me because I didn't have a CS degree and because I didn't know where to begin. But I did know how to write, and I love writing, so I decided I was going to incorporate that into this project somehow. And I picked a very simple goal. I was going to learn one computer science topic and write a blog post about it every single week for a whole entire year. There's 52 weeks in a year, <laughs> FYI. <laughs> and I actually did do it. Um, and yes, it was actually a very long year. <laughs> Um, and sometimes it was really, really fun. Um, in the process of learning something new um, that I had really no background in and kind of had to dive into head first, I felt pretty empowered and liberated because finally a lot of the light bulbs um, and a lot of the terms that I had heard, they started going off in my head and I started making all these connections. Um, and it made me kind of feel like I belonged in the industry a bit more because I finally understood what people were referencing. Um, and there were all these concepts and jargon that finally started to make sense and click. But to be completely honest with all of you, because this is a very safe space, 
it was also very, very intimidating and scary and hard a lot of the time. In fact, the harder that the topics got, and as the year went on, I felt that there was kind of a lack of resources, and it started to get more and more difficult as I started to get into more and more complex topics. I had a hard time finding approachable resources that I could really make sense of. And here's a tweet from one afternoon uh, when I was trying to learn about radix trees, which some of you might know about. Um, I didn't, and I foolishly was like, yes, let me learn about this. Um, I felt pretty helpless at that moment in time, helpless enough that I decided to tweet it out to the whole world and tell them that I had no idea what I was doing. But in case you're unfamiliar with this owl meme that I'm referencing here, this is what I was <laughs> talking about. I feel like maybe there's a couple steps missing here, like maybe like a 1A or a 1B or a 1C or anything. Um, but this is what computer science kind of felt like um, when I was learning it for the first time. And perhaps this sentiment resonates with some of you, whether it comes to your own learning for computer science or any topic in general. I think the most frustrating part of this whole project was feeling like these resources should, in theory, be helping me, but kind of not really finding that to be the case. I would find these resources and then realize that they kind of expected me to have this context in order to make sense of them, and I didn't have that. And oftentimes, I'd try to uh, dig into academic papers or read blog posts or you know, watch lecture videos, and even after the first, second, or third time reviewing them, I still didn't really feel like I understood what they were talking about. And it was pretty disheartening. But it was actually this exact feeling of helplessness that motivated me to keep going. Because I knew that if at least I felt like this, there had to be at least one other person in the world who felt the same way too. And I didn't want them to have to struggle the same way I did because I knew firsthand how painful it could be. And even though sometimes that meant a lot of late nights and maybe even a few tears, I eventually actually got through every single CS topic that I set out to write about for that year, including radix trees, uh, which coincidentally still feels like the hardest topic of the year for some reason. The written based CS project eventually got turned into a podcast that I co-host with my friend Saran. Uh, it's called the Base CS Podcast, and I have some Base CS Podcast stickers. If you would like one, you can come find me after this. Um, and I also turned it into a video series with the dev.to platform, the practical developer. And we created a video version of that same written series. And with each new project, the Base CS Podcast, the video series, I started to realize that there was a very high demand for resources just like this one. I started to see that there was not just a lot of interest in it, but people really, really needed, it seemed like, these computer science accessible resources. And this made me realize that the struggles that I faced while trying to teach myself CS, well, they were part of a larger problem. It wasn't just me. There were a lot of other people who wanted to learn those CS fundamentals, but like me, they were having a hard time finding the accessibility to understand them. And my year of intensively learning computer science um, fundamentals was probably one of the hardest in my career, um, and somehow um, one of the most important things I learned along the way that I thought I knew already but was really reinforced through this process was the fact that learning new things is hard. In fact, it's extremely hard. If you've ever had to teach yourself something new, as I imagine pretty much everybody in this room has, um, then you know this to be true. And while I was creating content for Base CS, I began wondering, how did other people learn new things? I'm sure other people had to solve this problem before, so how did they approach it? I set out to try to answer this question, and not just because I wanted to get better at my own learning, but because I wanted to be able to make the best resources for the most people. So I did some research. 
Okay, I did a lot of research. I somehow read a lot of papers on like psychology and science and like the history of learning. And one of the names that came up quite often um, was this guy. I stumbled upon his work. Uh, you might have heard of him. His name is Richard Feynman. Um, he was an American theoretical physicist who created the field of quantum electrodynamics. So I always have to look at my notes for that because I'm like, wait, what did he create? I, uh, what? <laughs> quantum electrodynamics. Um, you might actually know him from some other things he was involved in, involved in too. Um, for example, he won, uh, the Nobel, he won a Nobel Prize. He also um, helped develop the atomic bomb. And he was the person who was responsible for figuring out what went wrong with the NASA uh, Challenger disaster, too. But some other things you might not know. He was also an author, a philosopher, an amateur artist, uh, a lock picker, and a bongo player. <laughs> Got some bongo fans in here. I love it. Potato, potato. <laughs> um, I mean, if you just look at this list, plus all the other achievements that I listed, I mean, talk about learning new things. Feynman was always learning new things, it seemed like. And if you spend some time reading about his life, um, you start to see that Feynman accomplished a whole lot of things on, during his seven year, 70 years on this earth. But I think the one thread that kind of runs through all of the things that he created um, and contributed to is the fact that his achievements, um, whether they were professional or personal, all of them had to do with his desire to learn and understand new things. Richard Feynman was often called the great explainer. And he earned this nickname from his students and his fellow colleagues because he had a really unique way of explaining and communicating ideas and concepts. Sure, he made a lasting impact because of all his work, and yeah, he won a Nobel Prize, but I would say that it was his work as a teacher and a great explainer that left an even lasting impact, not just on his field, but on many other fields too. He had such a reputation as the great explainer, actually, that. Um, when he gave his first lecture as a graduate student, Albert Einstein actually came to that lecture because he had heard about his reputation. And many years later, Bill Gates actually um, explained that when he was younger, he had watched his uh, lecture videos. He had watched Feynman's lecture videos, and they had made such a big impact on him, and he called him the best teacher I never had. Gates was actually so inspired by Feynman's work that he ended up open sourcing his lectures on physics, and today you can go and watch them for free, um, and they're accessible to the whole, whole world. So sometimes it pays to have a student that does well, I guess. <laughs> um, but all of my reading on Feynman led me to wonder, how did Feynman get to the point of becoming such a great explainer? He had that nickname, but what did he do to get there? Why did people feel this way about him? How did Feynman himself learn new things? In order to answer that question, I think we need to go back to Feynman's time um, as a graduate student at Princeton. So during his second year, he had to study for um, something called oral exams. And while other students were kind of poring over textbooks and trying to memorize things, Feynman did not do that. Instead, he did something a little bit different. He bought a fresh, blank new notebook, and on top of that notebook, he wrote, notebook of things I don't know about, which is, I guess, a good start. In this notebook, he wrote down the things he didn't understand, the things he understood partly, and the things that he wanted to know more about, but he knew just a little bit. And then he set to work. He proceeded to unpack all of these topics that he had listed out. And uh, there's a great biography on Feynman written by James Gleick called Genius. And in that book, he describes this process of what Feynman was doing in his notebook pretty well. He says that in his notebook of things to learn, Feynman tried to find the essential kernels of each subject. 
Ironically, however, uh, Feynman's notebook technique was not foolproof. Uh, he actually did get one question wrong on his exam. <laughs> but at the end of these intense learning sessions, he did always end up with this notebook that was filled of things that he had actually understood. And he was pretty proud of it. And by the end of the session, he had this actual empirical evidence of how far he had come when the notebook was blank versus when he filled it up at the end. OK, so we may not all be uh, Nobel Prize winning physicists. Um, but we do all have things that we'd like to learn about and learn more about. And we all learn in different ways. So even if we don't end up picking the bongos um, or learning about how to paint um, or how to pick a lock, there is still something we can learn from Feynman. We can learn how to learn. Throughout the course of his life, Feynman picked up a lot of different skills, as we've seen, and he taught many different things. He developed a technique through the process of learning something new again and again and again. And these days, educators and psychologists um, and even scientists reference this technique. It's called the Feynman technique. And it's surprisingly simple. Um, it's actually just going back to the same things that he did when he was a grad student at Princeton. The Feynman technique is just four steps. So let's walk through these four steps together. The first and foremost thing, the first thing you have to do really in, when you're using the Feynman technique is identifying what on earth it is that you're trying to learn about. And what this really means is really getting a sense of the topic and the subject. Before you can really go about on, like studying anything, you have to understand what it is so that you can really direct your efforts. The best way to do this is to write down everything that we know about a topic. And as we learn more about it, well, then we can add to our repository of knowledge. Once we know what a topic really is, we can get to step number two, which is taking our pre-existing knowledge of that topic and trying to explain it to someone who would know nothing about it. So for best results, you should try explaining the topic as though you were teaching it to a child. If anyone in this audience has children, you might be like, what? <laughs> but stick with me here. It might seem strange at first, but the Feynman technique for um, explaining things simply actually has a really important reason. Explaining something as though you are teaching it to a child forces you to speak in plain and simple terms. Just imagine describing a web request or caching or distributed systems to a child. No, I mean really imagine it. <laughs> you might have to take a second to think about what words you'd use or how you would even start explaining the thing that seems so simple maybe to you. The interesting part about this is that we might forget this, but children are not likely to understand jargon or complex terminology. Feynman once said that when we speak without jargon, it frees us from hiding behind knowledge that we don't actually have. <laughs> uh, I feel like this is him being, him just calling bullshit on a lot of people, but <laughs> subtweeting it. <laughs> By forcing himself to explain things, he realized that complicated words and jargon can just kind of become a crutch you can sometimes say things without, without actually understanding what they mean and just say them to say them. Jargon can, lend its, let, can lead us to think that we um, understand everything just because we know the words for it. But in reality, it might be the case that we don't understand the concepts, the underlying concepts behind the words. So by explaining things simply, we actually force ourselves to get to the heart of a concept. By explaining things simply, 
you begin to understand what you truly under, what you've truly understood about a concept rather than the terms that you know to describe it. Another benefit to explaining things the way that you would to a child is that it forces us to be brief. Brevity is so important um, if you are teaching things to someone who's new to a concept. If you've hung out with children very much, you know that maybe they don't have the longest attention span. So you have to really think a lot about what things you're going to explain and what ideas you're going to introduce, and not just about what words you're going to use, too. Being brief pushes us to be creative about the way that we explain something. And we also have to be concise yet understandable. And actually, I kind of feel like words here are pretty limiting. There are other tools at our disposal that help us be brief while communicating ideas. And here's where illustrations and drawings and diagrams actually come in. In fact, Feynman famously used diagrams to explain one of the most complex ideas. The most famous of them is this one, a Feynman diagram. He used this to describe the interaction between electrons as well as particle movements. At the time, Feynman's use of illustrations to explain a concept like this was pretty like revolutionary. People thought he was losing his marbles. They were very confused. Um, and this was especially true in the field of science back in the 50s. But now, Feynman diagrams are pretty well known, especially for explaining particle physics. Um, as a side note and as a bit of historical trivia, Feynman literally had Feynman diagrams on his van, and he used to drive them around um, campus. <laughs> uh, so he's pretty recognizable. And in case you could not recognize him, his license plate was also quantum. <laughs> so that tells you a lot about the kind of person he was. <laughs> um, that idea. I, I love how much of a nerd he was. It's great. But back to the Feynman technique. Um, once we've used simple terms to explain a concept, we'll notice that if we can't explain it using simple terms, it means that maybe we don't actually really understand the thing we're trying to explain or teach. And that brings us to step three, identifying any gaps in our knowledge. Once we know what the gaps in our knowledge are, once we can't explain something, well, now we know this is where we need to reinforce our understanding of something. This is the part where you go back and you hit the books, you find you know, videos or blog posts or other resources, and you fill in those gaps so that the next time you actually can explain them simply, briefly, without using complex terms. And this is where the actual learning happens. It's where you identify gaps in your own knowledge and understand what you need to fill in in order to expand your grasp of a concept. If we're forced to explain the basic ideas of a concept, we won't get very far if we're missing key points. And that's why this step, I think, is really the heart of the Feynman technique. But once we've iterated and gone back over and over and filled in our gaps, well, we're finally ready for the last step, organizing and simplifying our knowledge into a narrative. This involves organizing all of our accumulated knowledge and taking that topic and constructing a kind of story out of it. And this will help us, help us come up with ideas for how we can communicate the thing we've learned. When Feynman himself used this technique, he used pretty simple sentences in order to tell these stories. So for example, Feynman once described the concept of atoms like this. He said, all things are made of atoms, little particles that move around in perpetual motion, attracting each other when they are a little distance apart, but repelling upon being squeezed into one another. Now, he's actually explaining like, the concept of atoms and how they interact. But if you look at this sentence, you'll see that all the four steps of the Feynman technique are in play. This is just one sentence, so it's pretty brief. Uh, there's the idea has been explained kind of simply, concisely, and there's no terminology or jargon really in it. 
And he's actually taking that idea and he's constructing it into a narrative. He has these characters, the subjects of the sentence, the atoms that are the characters at play in the story. Kind of cool if you think about the fact that he was able to sum that up in like a handful of words. Feynman also used analogies to help supplement those narratives that he would construct. He helped turn the abstract concepts into more concrete ideas using analogies, especially when he was trying to communicate them to someone else who may not even be familiar with the subject. And it wasn't just particle physics that he could describe so concisely. Um, in the 80s, Feynman started giving lectures on computers. And if you Google computer heuristics lecture, um, you can actually find uh, like this hour-long lecture that he gave. Um, it's pretty fun, uh, especially from a computer science point of view. Um, I highly recommend uh, watching it. So it's a really long lecture, but there's one sentence I really like from this, um, from this class that he gave. He uses the analogy of a file clerk and a filing cabinet to explain computers. Um, he explains how a computer retrieves and computes and writes and handles data. And this is what he calls a computer system. He says that a computer system is a glorified, high class, but very, very fast, but stupid filing machine, filing system. Too many words. Glorified, high class, very fast, but stupid filing system, which is pretty wonderful if you think about the fact that he just summed up what you know, computing is trying to achieve in a few words. And the interesting thing is that he did this back when very few people um, knew even what a computer was. It was kind of before personal computers or around the time that personal computers were really coming onto the scene. Um, so he was explaining this to people who didn't know what a computer was and most people couldn't even explain it, much, not, much less describe what it was. So that's pretty cool. And his, if, you, if you watch this lecture, you'll see that his analogy actually still holds true all of these years later. And I think the Feynman technique is pretty wonderful for many reasons, but for people in computer science especially to, to utilize, because it forces us to test our understanding of a topic, and it forces us to challenge our assumptions. And by this, I don't just mean our assumptions about a topic, but also our assumptions about what we do or don't know. In software and in computer science, possibly the hardest uh, obstacle to get over is understanding the limits, not just the limits of a problem, but the limits of your own knowledge, um, of a technology, the constraints of your own assumptions. And you don't know what you don't know. And the, I think the Feynman technique kind of forces us to confront that fact pretty head on. You have to see your own gaps in your own knowledge, and then you begin to see what those constraints actually are. And only when we see our own gaps are we really well equipped to fill them? He famously once said that I'm smart enough to know that I'm dumb. And I think it can be pretty hard to come to terms with your own understanding and lack of understanding for, in some cases, um, especially when you're learning something new. The Feynman technique makes that a little bit easier, in my opinion, because we're constantly reinforcing what we do know along the way. You go through the cyclical process of building up and filling gaps in your knowledge, and going through that process, you realize, oh, I know a little bit more than I did last time, but there's still a little bit left to learn. I think it's one of the few techniques that makes learning become a little bit more of an empathetic task, because you are a little bit less harsh on yourself, because each time you also acknowledge the things you do know as you fill in your own gaps. But there's an even bigger reason that I think the Feynman technique is important for the realm of computer science and software. It's because it teaches us to be better explainers. We're forced to reframe our own mental model of learning. And we realize that when we fill our own gaps, we become better teachers in the process and better explainers. Feynman was known as the great explainer because he could take any topic and before teaching it, he would make sure that someone who had no idea about it would still 
understand and benefit from the thing he was explaining. At one point, he uh, actually decided to give lectures to students who didn't even study physics because he wanted to make them excited about physics. So he, who won a Nobel Prize in physics, decided to give introductory le lectures on particle physics without using any of the terminology that you probably would have seen in academic papers at the time. He wanted to make anything accessible, and he took it upon himself as a challenge to make it accessible, even though he might already have some ideas about the topic themselves. In 1964, Feynman gave um, a series of seven-hour lectures at Cornell University, and they were recorded by the BBC. And today, thanks to Bill Gates, you can actually watch those lectures for free. But in those lectures, he started explaining ideas that eventually would be used and referenced by teachers, by people in their households, uh, people who didn't study physics, students, young, uh, young people as well. And it was really interesting to see because he sort of became a household name, even though in a lot of ways he was living and existing in this ivory tower of academia. He wanted to sort of break that down and bring other people along for the ride. He didn't want to keep all that knowledge for himself. He wanted to open it up to everyone else. And he used that as a reflection of his own capability, whether he was able to actually do that or not, which I think is pretty unique through the history of academia, but especially in STEM fields. But more than his contributions to physics or math or science, I think that it was his technique for learning and his life's work that shows us that making knowledge accessible opens doors for others. It's interesting when you start thinking about what Feynman actually did for his own field of study. By creating these lectures that teachers and parents and students and people who maybe were studying the humanities could watch, well, he started bringing down these social constructs of someone not being good enough to understand something. It's particularly interesting when you think about um, the gatekeeping that existed back then and continues to exist today um, to see somebody who could have very well been a gatekeeper but who decided to open the gates instead. I think that this idea of bringing knowledge, bringing your own knowledge to the masses is really important in tech because tech needs more great explainers. Feynman did this for physics and he did it for other aspects of science as well. But what would this look like if we did it for our industry? Technology is simultaneously more complicated and more ubiquitous than it has ever been before. And there are many people who are not in this room who kind of feel intimidated by it. But as an industry, I'm sure we could all benefit from more voices and more representations within the field. So if we were better explainers, perhaps we could bring them into this room and into our industry as well. Now more than ever, we need to make our knowledge accessible because it's going to make our industry more diverse. If we can reach people who are traditionally underrepresented in the industry and help bring them into it, well, we'll start to get more unique voices in the field. Through accessible resources, people who don't have access or may not uh, have the means to get a computer science education can suddenly understand this world and hopefully bring down the idea that they're not good at it, just like Feynman did for physics. This would mean that we'd also reach people who are in the industry but want to learn something new. But maybe they're just struggling to find the right resources. If everyone in our field started working towards becoming a better explainer, I think we'd actually become a lot more inclusive of people who already exist in the industry, not just people who are trying to get into it. For example, if there had been an explanation of radix trees back when I was learning it that didn't involve complex calculus, 
I might have not cried for the first time when I tried to learn them. <laughs> if everyone made teaching part of their learning process, then grasping new concepts would be a lot more fun and a lot easier for all of us. But of course, I've been talking about how it's great for everyone, but it's not all selfless. There's something in it for you, too. Um, there are some personal benefits. For example, teaching while learning makes it a lot easier. And learning new things is empowering. Not only does it make, it feel, make you feel good about yourself, but learning also keeps you in the loop about what's happening in the field and the latest technologies in use. It makes it easier when you want to learn a new tool or a framework or a language. For me, learning the fundamentals of computer science through writing the Base CS series made me feel a whole lot more confident. It made me feel like I actually had a place in the industry. Uh, it made me less afraid of abstractions. It made me um, less fearful of changing my code and more willing to try new things out. And I think I'm a better programmer for it today. So how can each of us become better explainers? We can create our own form of accessible knowledge. And we can use the Feynman technique to help us. For some of us, that might mean writing a blog post or contributing documentation or perhaps uh, pairing with somebody who's new on the team who's trying to learn the very thing that you just learned the other day. If we all did this, if we all actually tried to become great explainers, then we'd create something that would actually last long after we put it out into the world. Technologies change and languages become old and outdated perhaps, but future generations who join this industry will be here with a little bit less pain for having had someone who made those resources and made that knowledge accessible when they started out. Maybe we'll keep some people from leaving the industry, and maybe we'll encourage new ones to join in as well. As Feynman showed us, making our own knowledge accessible can have a lasting impact, one that lasts way beyond our time here. If we were all great explainers, I think ultimately we'd leave the industry so much better than how we found it. And Frankly, I don't think that there's a much better contribution than that. Thank you. <laughs>